We're going to move yeah. to our last presentation is about prevention. And uh, we have Dr. Rafi Landovitz, who's going to lead us through a panel discussion on that. Thanks very much, Dr. Sag. And I just want to thank everyone for sticking with us um, uh, throughout this course. I know um, it's been a, a prolonged day, so, so thanks for sticking with us to the end. Um, I'm going to briefly review um, uh, a case with a number of different uh, decision points for us to ponder together and discuss that highlight some of the guideline recommendations in the new IAS USA 2022 guidelines, including um, some departures from the previous guidelines and some notable departures from um, things that are either in product packaged inserts or other guideline documents. So um, I'll try and point those out as they particularly um, come up. Um, so these are my disclosures, and these are our learning objectives for this session. Um, the case that we're going to be discussing today is Angeline. Uh, Angeline is a 29-year-old trans feminine patient who came into uh, the clinic to discuss HIV prevention options. Um, she's got an extensive history that uh, it took a long time uh, and a, a, of developing relationships to be able to um, uh, gain the trust to get all of this information. But she shares that nine months ago, she was hospitalized for um, a traumatic assault from a former partner. And that assault occurred in the setting of that partner finding oral PrEP medication in her purse, um, uh, something that we unfortunately all too frequently hear that um, disclosure of PrEP use can sometimes lead to um, uh, intimate partner violence. Um, so we'll come back to that uh, as we discuss this case. Um, her medical conditions um, also uh, deserve special consideration. Uh, she has poorly controlled hypertension, type two diabetes, chronic kidney disease with a baseline creatinine clearance of 65 milliliters per minute um, and dyslipidemia at all uh, as well. She's not currently using gender affirming hormone therapy, but she is considering a number of different gender affirming surgical procedures and to, including the potential for gluteal fat transfers. Um, so our first question, let me see if I can advance these slides is, so uh, given that we have this 29 year old trans feminine uh, patient who's inquiring about her biomedical prevention options, um, what do you think are her options? And we have a poll for you to respond to. Okay, let's see what people think. Okay. So uh, great, we've got a wide variety of answers here. Some people thought that you know um, all of the currently FDA approved options that are listed um, uh, in choice D uh, are actually uh, an option for her. I would point out that 211 or on-demand prep that we'll talk more about only applicable to TDF, FTC, technically not FDA approved nor CDC recommended for that particular dosing strategy. And then some people thinking that some, some, some of those options might not be good options for her. Um, what do our panelists think? What, what, do, what, what are the considerations here? Well, Anyone? go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I think she's got actually quite a number of options available to her. I would want to talk with her about her previous experience on PrEP, um, given that she'd had this violent uh, incident happen. Um, she may be uh, wary of using an oral PrEP agent. Um, and so Cab LA is an option for her. If she has gluteal implants, that complicates things somewhat. She doesn't at this point. Um, and we are still awaiting data on thigh injections for Cab LA. Um, but she does have some oral agent uh, options as well, if that's something that she wants to consider. And 211 uh, prep is something that in the ISUSA guidelines we would um, put as a recommended option for trans feminine uh, individuals, uh, particularly if they're not already on gender affirming hormones, which may lower the, 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 um, amount of uh, tenofovir uh, 
present in the rectal secretion. So given that she doesn't, doesn't sound like she has a neovagina, which would um, eliminate the options of TAF as well as of two-on-one prep, um, it sounds like she actually has quite a number of options available to her. That's thanks. To, thanks, um, Susan. Yeah, Raj, please. It that way. It's yeah. really people who are having receptive vaginal sex that really shouldn't, at least right now, get TAF FTC or 211. And so that, that's, that helps me think about it is um, um, since she doesn't have a, she's not having, um, she doesn't have a neo vagina. So, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I, I think, Susan, thank you. That's really exactly, I think, how we want to be thinking about this. And, and um, you know, the, the ISUSA uh, guidelines, I think, attempted this time to be really user-friendly to um, clinicians who might be seeing patients who have certain risk behavior and trying to figure out what the options are to, um, to offer them in terms of PrEP. I completely agree with you that there may be reticence that may lead to challenges with adherence based on this horrible history of prior intimate partner violence in the setting of oral prep um, disclosure to a partner and agree that cabotegravir might be a, a really nice option for her. But um, it doesn't mean that if she were interested in an oral prep option, that that would not be okay. And, you know, as, as Dr. Bookbinder, as you, as you mentioned, you know, um, in the, this version of the guidelines, we do note that TDF FTC based on demand or two on one prep is now recommended for cisgender and transgender men, as well as transgender women. And of course, as you mentioned, um, uh, particular care needs to be taken, particularly for transgender women who are on gender affirming hormone therapy, therapy because of the concern of estradiol and estradiol augmented by anti-androgen effects um, leading to lower plasma and tissue concentrations of the tenofovir component. Um, of the PrEP regimen. And that would be a particular concern at, at um, inception of a two-on-one regimen. But also TAF FTC, as you mentioned, we are now uh, comfortable endorsing for trans women. You'll remember that the DISCOVER study actually enrolled a fairly small number of trans feminine identified participants in that trial, which is a trial that led to US FDA um, approval of TAF FTC as a PrEP agent for all routes of sexual exposure, except for vaginal exposure. But the in, uh, increasing body of pharmacokinetic and clinical evidence suggests that likely this is going to be okay with the caveat, as you noted, that we don't have any data in the context of a neo-vagina um, where that is either formed usually from scrotal tissue or colonic remnants. And we just don't know how these agents perform in that context. Um, did anyone on the panel have additional thoughts or, or comments yeah. about that? One of the audience uh, members uh, wanted to recap this a little bit. So their conclusion from what you're saying is that 211 PrEP uh, is not recommended for trans women on estrays. Is that what you're saying or opposite? No, you just want to uh, have caution right as you're beginning it, because particularly in the rectal compartment, that initial dosing may not get up to what we believe to be. And of course, no one knows for sure, um, but uh, the pharmacokinetic targets that we're trying to reach in rectal tissue. So if someone's going to be using it um, in a two-on-one manner um, and they're beginning to uh, you know, use it and for that intermittent sexual exposures, you really pro probably want to have multiple mechanisms of HIV prevention at play during that inception period. Okay. And maybe since we're on that topic, since it's an important one and one that's, I think, really nicely laid out in the guidelines, um, is it the estrogen, the estradiol or the estrogen itself, or is it the anti-androgen with the estrogen, or is it either or? Yeah, so the estradiol component was shown to uh, have a pharmacokinetic reduction, mostly in A1, AUC, 
um, on tenofovir um, uh, concentrations. That was not thought to be really clinically significant. It's when combined with antiandrogens that there's a larger decrease that may rise to the level of clinical significance. We honestly don't know. Um, we don't have clinical correlates in this context, um, but you know the 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 pharmacokinetic correlates of protection suggests that even with both those agents on board, there is likely significant protective efficacy. You may be getting to this, but since you were talking about inception, can you just remind the entire group, um, including all of us panelists, how long does it take for someone um, to be protected once they start oral prep, uh, let's say a cisgender man or a cisgender woman? Just remind the, the group of that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Gandhi. So, you know, our previous understanding um, of the timing of onset of protection with a TDF FTC based regimen um, was that rectal um, uh, rectal protection reached maximum levels about five to seven days after inception of single oral daily dosing. The CDC information and early pharmacokinetic studies suggested. Um, that for parenteral, that is injection drug use exposures or vaginal protection, you might need as long as 21 days of daily dosing. We no longer believe that that is the case. And we believe that somewhere in that same seven day period of oral dosing, you likely get maximal protection with those other routes of exposure. The reason, particularly for rectal exposures, that the IAS USA guidelines recommend that you initiate even someone who is going on daily TDF FTC dosing with a double dose up front is really from the rectal pharmacokinetic data from the IPERGAY study that suggests that you would get um, protective rectal concentrations within 24 hours of the administration of that double dose. So, it, if there is a question of whether there's going to be an exposure early on in the initiation of TDF FTC based prep, we think that the safety profile is significant is, is benign enough, and the potential for benefit vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, more rapid onset of rectal protection. That's why, really, in 2020 and again here in 2022, we've recommended initiating TDF FTC prep with that double dose. There was. Um, an increased rate of adverse events of a renal variety, including a case of Fanconi syndrome when double dose TDF FTC was dosed longitudinally, but that shouldn't really be a concern with a single double dose in this way. Other thoughts or comments about that? Okay. I think, you've, I think you've been very clear, Rafi, but uh... What wasn't what I think is the one of the attendees is still struggling with is if someone is having intermittent exposures, let's say once every three months, and they want to go to and they're, they're trans woman and they're on the estradiol, so two one one would not be a great option for them because they're going to be in going through inception. Yeah, every agree. Three months. That's agree. okay. Agree. That, that, agree. That, yeah, yeah, okay. That's what I thought you were saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think the 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 real utility of two one one is for people who are having fairly infrequent sex. Otherwise, it quickly devolves into daily dosing. Um, it is in the context of that ultimately frequent two one one dosing that may end up devolving into daily dosing that we're most comfortable for trans feminine populations using gender affirming hormone therapy because of that concern if they're starting essentially from no levels and going yep. to that immediate dosing. Makes perfect sense. Perfect. Thank you. And and our our aspiration for this somewhat large and complicated table that is in the guidelines um, this time uh, is, is really to um, have something that people could print out and laminate and keep like in their clinic consult rooms um, to refer to. The attempt was to make it as user-friendly as possible. You can give us feedback um, on, um, on whether or not we've succeeded in that, in that realm. Okay, so as you're reviewing Angeline's prep options, she discloses that she recently has met a new partner. They have a sexual relationship, but also share injection drug needles. She's not sure about the sterility of these needles before use. 
While she does not intend to have other sexual partners while seeing her current partner, she's unsure about whether he is having additional partners outside of her. She does not feel like she can ask him his HIV status and is not sure she would believe his answer if she did ask him. She asked if any of that information changed your thoughts on what's best for her for her pre-exposure prophylaxis. So most of these options are the same as before. Option E is a little bit different now that we have this history of potential injection drug exposures. And so let's have our, our audience vote. Okay, let's see what people thought. Okay, wow, um, that's a pretty even distribution of options. Uh, what do our panelists think? We now have an additional history of potential for an injection drug or parenteral exposure in addition to the previous known exposures um, via sexual route. I'll speak up just uh, acknowledging the limited data in, in this specific population who injects drugs, but certainly is that this patient is definitely at risk. I would say most of these patients, their sexual risk is their greater risk factor than their injection. We know that you go hand in hand. It's hard to tease out which is which is which when we do have a serum conversion, but I don't like the on-demand option. Um, and I think the best option is probably the one that will be most um, patient-centered for this patient. Um, and what, Thanks, I, what, I would, what I would add to that, Ray P, is that, you know, we need to be now sure that she, what's her status with hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So we have other issues to consider, not just, you know, HIV prevention in her setting. And, and we need to think about the entire patient and the entire prevention situation. So, yeah, I would probably just, I, I would probably with, with, with option A, that's probably the one that I would recommend the most, but you can think about others. We're in a data-free zone. Right. And and to that point, that really addresses uh, the cabotegravir uh, concept here because of the concern. Now, ideally, if they're in care with you, you'll be getting them vaccinated for B, hopefully. Uh, but that's getting her, sorry, vaccinated for B. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think that's a really good point. Um, and Ellen, I, I really want to thank you for bringing up that notion that, you know, really, um, although we're really in almost data-free zones for all of these regimens, with the possible exception of TDF alone from the Bangkok tenofovir study that showed a 49% reduction in HIV incidence in um, people uh, uh, randomized to TDF alone, we tend to generalize that to TDF, FTC, and even TAF, FTC-based regimens I agree that I probably wouldn't be very excited about a 2 on one regimen in this case, but um, I, I do think uh, the hepatitis B, if unvaccinated issue, could loom large. Um, there are no human data um, on cab -LA for parenteral exposures. There is a macaque model that shows significant protection with parenteral exposures. That, of course, is not human data, and we eagerly await some bridging studies that are getting into the field now that will hopefully inform uh, that question. Um, I, the point that I really wanted to make by sort of bringing this up um, is that we are really in an almost data-free zone about this population, but if uh, someone with injection drug use history is sexually active, then really you should consider them with their risk group for sexual activity. Carlos brings up these really important points, as does Mike, about, you know, hepatitis. And, you know, if someone's unvaccinated and you're unable to vaccinate them, um, that may be a consideration. And, of course, you'll want to do um, perhaps more aggressive surveillance for hepatitis C as we go along as well. Other Ray, comments Ray, from the panel about that? Yes. Yeah, sorry, my dog's excited. So, so Rafi, my other comment would be, and this for the audience that have not seen the paper yet, we, we are showing this table, and I really think this table was an incredible addition to, to the guidelines. Uh, I think this is really in the guideline a very good table because you are dealing with different populations. The recommendations are different, and this table puts everything together in one place. So I recommend that people look at this table and really follow it. It's a lot of information is right there. Thanks, thanks, Carlos. And again, if as people sort of digest this, please let us know if you can think of things that we left out of this table that could make it more user-friendly. The attempt, even though it is dense, was to make it as user-friendly as possible. 
Okay, just in the interest of time, let's move on. So um, uh, as we consider these various PrEP options, the question comes up, what tests should be used to screen for HIV as we go into and monitor for breakthrough PrEP infections on these various regimens that we're discussing? So in speaking with colleagues, you've heard that the CDC in their 2021 updated PrEP guidelines recommend both HIV antigen antibody and HIV RNA testing before initiating both tenofovir and cabellate-based PrEP and both HIV antigen and antibody and HIV RNA testing before each PrEP dispensation, either oral or injectable. And this has been a somewhat controversial recommendation and the IAS USA panel, there's not sort of a question posed to you here, is we agree to disagree with those recommendations. The IAS USA um, guidelines, and again, this is in that table, um, does recommend that an HIV antigen antibody test be used to screen before initiating oral tenofovir based PrEP, any of the regimens, and an HIV RNA only be sent in that context if there is a high risk exposure in the last four weeks or signs or symptoms consistent with acute or primary HIV infection. That's for tenofovir-based PrEP. For cabotegravir-based PrEP, we do agree that both tests should be sent both before and at every injection um, event uh, using injectable cabotegravir. You're wondering why this divergence from the CDC guidelines? And the answer is, um, the CDC actually has invoked the HPTN 083 data um, as supporting the need for this RNA-based testing um, with oral tenofovir-based PrEP, because in the tenofovir, the TDF-FTC-based arm of that study, there was on average a 30-day delay in HIV diagnostics when just using the antigen antibody. So it turns out that that's actually an administratively biased assessment Patients were only seen on average once a month, and all of the people who had that delay were actually in extremely early acute or primary HIV infection. And the consequences of missing that before the next visit were essentially none. So we do not believe that the added cost, operational feasibility, burden, and complexity of interpretation with oral tenofovir-based PrEP merits the addition of that to regular testing. I hope that makes sense. And anyone on the panel want to sort of uh, ex expand further on that that thought about uh, about its utility? No, I think I think you explained it extremely well. And I think you know at the end of the day, let's not let perfect be the enemy of the good. The big big challenge we have nationally and globally is we haven't scaled up prep the way we should, and creating more barriers and more costs actually will decrease the efficacy of prep. So. I, I really think that what we need to do is 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 use more prep and make it as much available as we can. And when you have a person, anybody that comes in asking about prep, we need to start them on prep. We really need to to do a better job. And I know most of us I, HIV physicians and people on this call are probably doing that, but the great majority of primary care providers are still quote unquote uncomfortable. And if we start adding complications and testing, they're even going to be more uncomfortable. Couldn't have said it better myself. And, um, Rafi, I would just say that it, if we start adding in the requirement for an HIV RNA test, it also limits who could administer PrEP. And as we start talking about pharmacy-based PrEP and so on, I, I think it sort of cuts out a whole section of um, the population that could actually uh, benefit from PrEP if it weren't in a medicalized setting. Thanks, Melanie. I think that's that's another really critical point that really, if unless we bring it to people, um, it's clear that we're never going to get to the people who need these interventions the most. Fantastic. All right. So this particular patient, Angeline, decides to initiate long-acting injectable cabotegravir. Um, you do a rapid phlebotomized uh, antigen an uh, antibody test in the office and it's negative and she has no signs or symptoms of acute HIV infection. She decides to skip the four week oral lead in that is optional before going uh, to the injections and she opts to go so-called direct to inject and she gets her first injection without 
any problems. She's actually on time for her second injection, which is given four weeks later, at which time also her phlebotomized antigen antibody and HIV RNA testing are again negative, and then she disappears. You try and call her, her phone is disconnected, you have some emergency contacts, but you're unable to reach her, and she misses her third injection. So 15 weeks after that second injection, so seven weeks late, right? Because ideally we would have had that injection eight weeks after the second injection. She gets her phone restored and is able to come in that day for the injection. So what do you tell her? You're going to obviously strategize with her about how she can stick with the, the injection schedule. But um, what do you tell her? Um, is the, the way forward, some options for you to vote on. Okay, let's see what people think. Okay, we have a couple of different options here. Um, uh, people liked proceeding with the injection um, and plan to reload her four weeks later. That actually would be consistent with the FDA package insert for this product. Um, some people uh, said, let's just soldier on at eight week intervals. 18% uh, of you chose option C. That actually is the IAS USA recommendation, and I'll come back to why in just a second. Um, and then some people said, hey, let's hold the injection and wait the results um, of that HIV um, uh, panel of tests. And you know, I, I would argue that um, you don't need to await the results of these antigen antibody and viral load tests, either before starting injectable prep or um, at the time of injections, as long as you are able to follow up with the patient should a positive result come back, um, in which case you would intensify the regimen to a fully suppressive regimen. What I really wanted to point out with this sort of somewhat involved and complicated question is this recommendation where we diverge from the current FDA package insert. And in particular, this notion of when you need to reload. Um, and the reason we um, state that reloading should be required after an eight week delay, not a four week delay, um, is because that's actually what was studied. That's what was studied in HPTN 083 and 084, which gave the superiority result of cabotegravir compared to daily oral TDFFTC. Four week reloading has not been studied in the prevention context. I believe that the reason that the label reads that way by the FDA is to harmonize with what is done in cabinuva treatment. And also it's a more conservative approach, but is it necessary? I would argue no, and it hasn't been studied. And therefore what makes the most sense to the guidelines panel was that we do what is actually data driven, which is only reloading if there is an eight week delay. So after, so for the second injection, 12 or more weeks late, and for third and subsequent injections, 16 or more weeks late, which would not have been the situation for this particular patient. Um, the other way in which the ISUSA guidelines diverge from the FDA label in the United States is there's a really complicated instruction for what you do if someone is going, known to going to be late for an injection. It says you can bridge that delay if it's more than seven days with oral cabotegravir product, um, which it turns out is extremely difficult to operationalize and really, in my mind, is a complexity that isn't required. And they say only if the delay is going to be longer than two months should you invoke an oral prep product. And I don't think that really makes sense, and neither did the panel. And so our recommendation is if you're going to bridge orally, and it's a longer than seven day delay from the planned injection, just do it with an approved prep product appropriate for that sexual exposure. Any of the panelists have comments or thoughts about that? I wanna be mindful of the time. We're at getting toward the very end of our time together and wanna to get to one last point. Yeah, go ahead and move on. Yeah, move on. Yeah. Okay, great. So the last thing I wanted to tell you was, so now she came in, she got that third injection and her, HIV antigen antibody test results negative. 
but her HIV RNA returns 1,200 copies per milliliter. She's generally in in asymptomatic, but had been diagnosed with SARS-CoV-2 since you last saw her. And although she's recovered, she has some lingering, fairly protein symptoms. She's a little fatigued. It's, it's sort of unclear if that's related to the, the COVID infection or what's going on. Her last sexual contact with her partner was about three weeks ago. And the question is, what do you, how do you interpret these results? See what you think. Okay, let's see what people thought. Okay, we had a lot of people who liked, it was clearly a breakthrough infection, go immediately to fully suppressive ART. That's certainly the fear. And we've certainly seen that uh, that breakthrough infection on cabotegravir certainly can look like this with um, a, a low uh, HIV viral load is the only evidence of HIV infection. Um, uh, some people were less sure, and some people said, I'd like to phone a friend. And, you know, it's unclear at this point. Um, I think with 1,200, I probably would go to a fully suppressive ART regimen and try and get more information. But um, I do want to point out there's actually an error in the guidelines. You'll see in our table that we actually have a number for the CDC. Um, it's actually the public-facing number for the CDC. Don't call that. You'll end up in a phone tree spiral in the text, there is the number for the National Clinicians Consultation Center. That's the number you should call. With any discordant, discrepant, confusing result, you'll get experts on the phone and can talk through these complicated cases, the decision trees, and really um, what the options are to try and both counsel the patient that's in front of you and make some decisions about how to move forward. All the different nuances are beyond the scope of what we're going to be able to cover today. Um, but happy to discuss with people offline if they have thoughts about what they would do in this setting. But we'll stop there and try and get some time for questions. Yeah, Ray, I would just like to emphasize that, you know, probably the best answer here is call that line or call a friend. This is a very complicated issue. And it's all of us are, you know, even experts are consulting each other what to do with this patient. So don't be afraid to call a friend in the situation. It's the best thing you can do. Absolutely agree. And, and, you know, if anybody's wondering, Dr. Del Rio is saying that because he and I have called each other numerous times about situations just like that. Um, and and it, it doesn't it. even have to be a friend. I mean, if you guys aren't friendly, I mean, that's <laughs> so one question relates to this. What is the onset of HIV protection after the first cab injection? Yeah. Um, so this is actually one of the most commonly asked questions. And the sh very short answer is we have no idea. Um, there are no clinical data because we do not yet know the correlates of protection for cabotegravir. Good news, because there have been so few infections, we haven't been able to tease that out. The pharmacokinetic data suggest that 95% of people will have what we anticipate to be protective levels um, within 48 hours of their first injection, um, uh, sorry, I misspoke, 50% of people will have protective levels by 48 hours, 95% by seven days. So somewhere between two and seven days likely lies the answer. Okay. Um, to the point about the HIV RNA, um, uh, Judy Davidoff is having trouble. She's in Maryland getting the HIV RNA covered for PrEP um, with a diagnosis and HIV expression. Do you have any other tips for uh, how to do this? Uh, not sure if I've translated the question accurately, but you can read it there. So that's interesting, Judy. I'd, I'd love to hear sort of what the sort of insurance situation is um, for that, um, because my, uh, when I've talked about this with Dimitri Daskalakis from the CDC, and um, I'm, I'm sure everyone knows about the recent tragic passing of Don Smith, who, you mm. know, used to be our go-to person um, at the CDC for issues exactly like this. One of the reasons for their including that in their guidance was so that insurances, particularly um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, payers, would have to cover it. Um, even if providers chose not to use it. So I'd love to hear more about what the insurance profile is of, of the situations in which it's being denied. Um, I tend to use uh, ICD-10 Z20.6, which is 
the exposure um, to HIV code and I have not had a problem, but um, maybe we can chat offline about your situation and we can strategize. And, and Rafi, just use this moment, just use this moment to remind everybody that yesterday or day before yesterday and this week, the United States Preventive Service Task Force has has upped, you know, prep to to recommendation grade A, which would, you know, which would be includes in, injectable calotegravir. And this would be really game changing as far as the the requirement under the Affordable Care Act for both Medicaid and insurance providers to 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 pay for this uh, for this treatment. And I, I would also say, I believe um, the recommendations currently in draft form and they are accepting comments. So it would be great for people to make those comments about how important it is and to be sure that not only the medication, but the administration and all of the testing, the HIV testing, the STI testing, are included in the required reimbursements. And, you know, they have been clear that for oral prep, STI testing is included, uh, must be covered, but I think we just wanna be sure that, um, that they get um, a tsunami of feedback about how important this is. And then this other question of, will PrEP map cover the HIV RNA? Yeah, I, I think it's a it's a great question. I think it's very state by state program dependent, right? Not every state actually has prep map programs. Yeah. So um, I, I think it's 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 at the program level those decisions. Um, so I, I I don't have a great answer for that. One one would hope. Yeah. Um, the one other additional point I just would make, and picking back on what Mike, you and Carlos and Melanie were saying, um, is yes, please do review those draft USPSTF. Um, guidelines. Um, it, it does stop short of calling out newer PrEP agents. And I have a fear that um, that unless specifically called out, insurance companies will use that as a loophole. So if you do have a moment to give feedback, encouraging people in addition to the recommendations Dr. Thompson made about the testing, um, I do think calling out the product specifically, which is covered through a variety of complicated pathways, is going to be critical. Yeah. The final question is more of just a uh, um, ventilation of, of frustration that a patient who was on PrEP and uh, went in and another doctor was seeing this patient for something else said, why are you on this medicine? Uh, you should just be using condoms um, and, and how to handle that. And I think it's reassurance to the patient and maybe a phone call to the doctor just to kind of say, you know, we don't, what you're saying is not appropriate. I don't know anything else to do, but it, there is a lot of uh, of that type of attitude among some providers, and I think we just have to fight through it. Rafi, thanks so much, and to the panel, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a great session.